1984 by George Orwell End of Part 2 Do you remember, Winston said, the thrush that sang to us that first day at the edge of the wood? He wasn't singing to us, said Julia. He was singing to please himself. Not even that. He was just singing. The birds sang. The proles sang. The party did not sing. All around the world, in London and New York, in Africa and Brazil, and in the mysterious forbidden lands beyond the frontiers, in the streets of Paris and Berlin, in the villages of the endless Russian plain, in the bazaars of China and Japan, everywhere stood the same solid, unconquerable figure, made monstrous by work and childbearing, toiling from birth to death, and still singing. Out of those mighty loins a race of conscious beings must one day come, you were the dead. Theirs was the future. But you could share in that future if you kept alive the mind as they kept alive the body and passed on the secret drop doctrine that two plus two make four. We are the dead, he said. We are the dead, echoed Julia dutifully. You are the dead, said an iron voice behind them. They sprang apart. Winston's entrails seemed to have turned into ice. He could see the white all around the irises of Julia's eyes. Her face had turned a milky yellow. The smear of rouge that was still on each cheekbone stood out sharply, almost as though unconnected with the skin beneath. You are the dead, repeated the iron voice. It was behind the picture, breathed Julia. It was behind the picture, said the voice. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you were ordered. It was starting. It was starting at last. They could do nothing except stand gazing into another's eyes. To run for life, to get out of the house before it was too late. No such thought occurred to them. Unthinkable to disobey the, disobey the iron voice from the wall. There was a snap as though a cat had been turned back and a crash of breaking glass. The picture had fallen to the floor and covering the telescreen behind it. Now they can see us, said Julia. Now we can see you, said the voice. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Clasp your hands behind your heads. Do not touch one another. They were not touching. It seemed to him that he could feel Julia's body shaking. Or perhaps it was merely the shaking of his own. He could just stop his teeth from chattering, but his knees were beyond his control. There was the sound of trampling boots below inside the house and outside. The yard seemed to be full of men. Something was being dragged across the stones. The woman's singing had stopped abruptly. There was a long, rolling clang, as though the washtub had been flung across the yard, then a confusion of angry shouts which ended in a yell of pain. The house is surrounded, said Winston. The house is surrounded, said the voice. He heard Julia snap her teeth together. I suppose we may as well say goodbye, he said. You may as well say goodbye, said the voice, and another quite different voice, a thin, cultivated voice which Winston had the impression of having heard before, struck in. And by the way, while we're on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed, here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Something crashed under the bed beside him. The head of a ladder that had been thrust window and had burst in the frame. Someone was climbing through the window. There was a stampede of boots up the stairs. The room was full of solid men in black uniforms with iron-shod boots on their feet and truncheons in their hands. Winston was not trembling any longer. Even his eyes, he barely moved. One thing alone mattered. Keep still. Keep still and not give them an excuse to hit you. A man with a smooth prize fighter's jowl, in which the mouth was only a slit, paused opposite him balancing his truncheon meditatively between thumb and forefinger. Winston met his eyes. The feeling of nakedness with one's hands behind one's head and one's face and body all exposed was almost unbearable. The man protruded the tip of a white tongue, licked the place where his lips should have been, and then passed on. There was another crash, 
Someone had picked up a glass paperweight from the table and smashed it on smashed it to pieces on the hearthstone. A fragment of coral, a tiny crinkle of pink, like a su- sugar rosebud from a cake, rolled across the mat. How small, thought Winston, how small it always was. There was a gasp and a thump behind him, and he received a violent kick on the ankle which nearly flung him off his balance. One of the men had smashed his fist into Julia's solar plexus, doubling her up like a pocket ruler. She was thrashing about on the floor, fighting for breath. Winston dared not turn his head, even by a millimetre, but sometimes her livid, gasping face came within the angle of his vision. Even, of his terror, even in his terror, it was as though he could feel the pain in his own body, a deadly pain which nevertheless was less urgent than the struggle to get back, to back her breath. He knew what it was like, the terrible, agonising pain which was there all the while but could not be suffered yet, because before all else it was necessary to be able to breathe. Then two of the men hoisted her up by the knees and shoulders and carried her out of the room like a sack. Winston had a glimpse of her face upside down, yellow and contorted with the eyes shut, but still with a smear of rouge on the cheek. That was the last he saw of her. He stood still. No one had hit him yet. Thoughts which came of their own accord but seemed totally uninteresting began to flit through his mind. He wondered whether they had got Mr. Charrington. He wondered what they had done to the woman in the yard. He noticed that he had badly wanted to urinate and felt a faint surprise because he had done so only two or three hours ago. He noticed that the clock on the mantelpiece said nine, meaning twenty-one, but the light seemed too strong. Would not the light be fading at twenty-one hours on an August evening? He wondered whether after all he and Juliet had mistaken the time, had slept the clock round and thought it was twenty-thirty, 2030, when really it was not 8.30 on the following morning. He did not pursue the thought further. It wasn't interesting. There was another lighter step in the passage. Mr. Charrington came into the room. The demeanour of the black uniform, uniform men suddenly became more subdued. Something that also changed Mr. Charrington's appearance. His eye fell on the fragments of the glass paperweight. Pick up those pieces, he said sharply. A man stooped to obey. The Cockney accent had disappeared. Winston suddenly realised whose voice it was that he had heard a few moments ago on the telescreen. Mr Charrington was still wearing his old velvet jacket, but his hair, which would have been almost white, had turned black. Also, he was not wearing his spectacles. He gave Winston a single sharp glance, as though verifying his identity, then paid more atten- no more attention to him. He was still recognisable, but he was not the same person any more. His body had straightened and seemed to have grown bigger. His face had undergone only tiny changes that had nevertheless worked a complete transformation. black eyebrows were still bushy, the wrinkles were gone, the whole lines of the face seemed to have altered, even the nose seemed shorter. It was the alert, cold face of a man of about fifty and five and thirty. It occurred to Winston that for the first time in his life he was looking with knowledge at a member of the Thought Police.